Hey everybody, tonight's video we kick off a brand new study here through the book of Ecclesiastes and the title of this video is I Can't Get No and you might know where this is going. Every time I read the book of Ecclesiastes, especially the first chapter here, it brings me back to a song and it sounds something like this, I can't get no satisfaction and uh, you probably know that song by Rolling Stones but Tonight, Lord willing, we start a brand new study here through the book of Ecclesiastes, which I know I did before, uh, I think back in like 2017 or whatever, but it's going to be a full week study, Lord willing, through the rest of winter. So the book of Ecclesiastes will bring us into the season of spring. So that should excite you at least on that part. So the book of Ecclesiastes, the author is unknown. It is highly believed and almost undebatable that it's Solomon. And it was written somewhere between 970 to 930 BC, but most likely 935 BC, right around that time. And the book of Ecclesiastes, as we go through this book, you might even be able to relate to it. You might feel the same way as the author of the book. So no further... Adieu, we'll read the first verse in Ecclesiastes 1.1. 1, 1. It says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. So the matters of the book are crucial issues for Solomon's faith. And they resemble the subject matter of Psalm 39 and Psalm 49. And we see the title pre uh, preacher in this verse. And preacher is the title of one who gathers the assembly together for instruction. Kind of like our system when you attend church on Sunday, you normally have the person giving the sermon who's the preacher. In the book of Ecclesiastes, what we'll see is unusual and one of the most difficult to understand books of the Bible. And we see in verse 1 that the preacher is... Uh, named uh, as David's son, which is where Solomon is believed to be the author. And there's other parts of Ecclesiastes we'll talk about where the opponents of Solomon will make their case. But verse 2 says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So in this first chapter especially, we're going to see the word vanity many, many times times. And vanity of vanities is the author's way of saying the greatest vanity. And this gives us the theme of the book, that everything is meaningless. In few books in the Bible give an explicit statement of the book's theme. We see in the book before this, which we'll go back and study another time, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 1-7, gives you the theme of the book of Proverbs of wisdom. And vanity occurs 38 times throughout this bo whole book of Ecclesiastes. And it means to breathe or to uh, like a vapor or fleeten. And in Ecclesiastes, it refers to frustrating, temporary, or perplexing. And the preacher here is using a hyperbole to encourage the reader to face the vanity of life. And as I've mentioned, you know, essentially he's saying that, you know, life is meaningless. And uh, Solomon wasn't the first person or the last person to see life this way. We just went through the book of Job and during Job's trials, he felt that life, what was the purpose of life to live this kind of life with these never ending issues. And many non-believers see nothing beyond life right now, especially atheists. And I know an atheist that, uh, you know, he we, we've, we've had discussions and his view is there's nothing after this life now. Uh, verse 3 says, What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? So Solomon, he's looking at the fleeting moments of life and the seemingly small gain for man's activity under the sun. 
And the only lasting efforts are those designed to accomplish God's purposes for eternity. And labor isn't just one's livelihood, but all of man's activity in life. And under the sun occurs 30 times to describe daily life. And it means under heaven and on earth. In verse 4 through 7, one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes to, toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea and the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. So the pictures of God's creation illustrate and underscore the feudal repetition of human activity. And the observer perceives life as an endless cycle of activity, which by itself doesn't bring security or meaning to man's experience. And in the world's you know, in science, they call it the circle of life. And people's experiences often fail to fill or satisfy them, just as waters never fill the sea. Hence, in a nutshell, Solomon or the author is saying that life can be frustrating. In verse 8 through 11, all things are full of labor. Man, man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the air filled with heron. That which has been is what will be. That which is done will uh, what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said? See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. So this is a summary of sorts. And Solomon looks at the effect of repetitious enduring activity in God's creation over many generations as compared to belief, comparatively profitless activity of one man, which fails to produce an enduring satisfaction. And he concludes that this is all wearisome. It's, it's, it's tiring. And another harsh reality comes with the realization that nothing is new and nothing will be remembered. You see, um, you know, I probably got, you know, average what they say for a lifespan these days for men. I, I probably got about 40 years left on this earth. I guarantee you after my kids are in heaven, my name and everything will be forgotten about me. You know, nothing is remembered. And a written record or some other object which serves as a reminder of these events, people, and things will be short-lived. You see, I used to enjoy, I wasn't into, you know, Wiccan or any of that stuff. But in my teenage years, I really, you know, I went through a whole depressing time throughout my teen years. And, you know, I just thought of, like, the meaning of life. I used to enjoy walking through the cemeteries in town behind the old congregational church that's been there for you know a couple hundred years and back at that time period they would bury people behind the church it's a new england type thing up here i'm not sure about other parts of the country but we're well known for cemeteries in the backyard of the church and i like to look at the tombstones and maybe i'm weird i don't care you know, I used to like to walk through and just look at the tombstones. Like, this person lived from 1799 to 1850. You know, and I would just sit there and think, I wonder what this person did with their life. They're probably not remembered at all today. As a matter of fact, the tombstones, some of them were very difficult to read. They were falling apart. They were, you know, breaking down on their own. You know, these things, even to remember them, are short-lived. And the lack of satisfaction articulates the theme of frustration, always wanting more and never having enough. And oftentimes we can live through life that way as well. We always want more. We, 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 we want 
we want more without being satisfied. Hence, can't get no satisfaction. And here the preacher reminds us that life is a spare of frustration. And days are frustrating many times for us. And Psalm 83 verse 4 in Jeremiah eleven nineteen shows no remembrance is a curse. And have you ever felt like despite man's work in progress, life seems the same? Have you ever thought about that? Even though we've come quite a bit away in the last hundred years, we still live in a world where people experience loneliness. People experience, you know, neglect. They don't get to, you know, feel kindness or any of that. Now it gets old quickly. And now you may understand the title based off the song from Rolling Stones, Can't Get No Satisfaction. So verse 12 through 15, it says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burden, some task God has given to the sons of man, by which they may be exercised, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. So not even a king can escape the vanity of life. And Solomon uses the term wisdom carries notions of ability for proper behavior, success, common sense, and wit. And man's search to understand is at times difficult, yet God has given as seen through Ecclesiastes. And God is found almost 40 times here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the emphasis is more on God's sovereignty and creation and providence than his covenant relationship through redemption. And one aspect of life's vanity is its fleeting character. And have you ever thought of the wind? I know we're going to be entering the month of March here in just a few days. March is a very windy time of the year for my area. We get a lot of wind storms. And much of what is desirable in life cannot be held in one's hand, as we'll see across Ecclesiastes. Just like if it's windy outside right now and I put my hand out, I can't hold the wind. The wind just goes right through. And with no necessarily moral implications being made, these words measure wisdom as the ability to resolve issues in life. And in spite of man's grandest effort, some crooked matters will remain unstraightened. And I want to make mention, like I mentioned in the book of First Kings study, Solomon's great wisdom was a gift from God. And God asked Solomon, he, God told Solomon he could ask for anything he wanted and it would be granted. And out of all the things of this world, Solomon asked for wisdom in 1 Kings 3 and 1 Kings chapter 4. And uh, let me know if you want to go back and review those videos. I can send them straight to you. And Solomon went on to write thousands of Proverbs in wisdom. I mean, the book right before this, the book of Proverbs, is mostly of Solomon. And uh, we're going to finish the verses in the chapter here, verse 16 through 18. It says, I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness, and have gained more wisdom than all who were with before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I have set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So, so I'm in verse 16. I commune with my heart saying, look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Many people take verse 16 because of the ruler over Jerusalem was only David before Solomon. And some argue Solomon's authorship here. And the verse likely refers to the pre-kings uh, such as Adoni Zedek 
back in John chapter 10, verse 1. And in verse 17, I set my heart to know, it speaks of Solomon depended observation of a one research rather than a divide revelation to understand life. And he found it to be an empty experience. And the expected outcome of wisdom is success. And success, in turn, should bring happiness. But Solomon concludes here that there is no guarantees. And this grieves the one who places his hopes in human achievements alone. You can be the smartest person on this earth. You can be the wealthiest person on this earth. But it, it brings you sorrow. And that's why we need Christ. So, the wrap-up of tonight's video, we look tonight at the vanity of life, the meaninglessness of life proclaimed by the preacher in verse 1. And he identifies himself vaguely, but most would agree with me that it is Solomon. And I apologize for the sun blocking me out. I think it's pretty cool. But while life may seem meaningless, we must remember the purpose of life. And I want to go over to 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 58 it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, my job that I provide for my family for is meaningless. It ain't going to matter a hundred years from now. You know, I my, my client site is a pharmaceutical company and, you know, they make products for sick people. And a hundred years from now, that ain't going to matter. What's happening today at work doesn't matter a hundred years from now. You know, realistically, labor on this earth is vanity. It's meaningless because our eternal purpose is heaven. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, when we serve God's kingdom, when we carry out the works of, you know, of the ministry, that when we carry out the kingdom of God, that is meaningful because it's going to impact people. They're going to come to faith in Christ and spend eternity with him. So, you know, labor on this earth, no matter what your occupation is, no matter what you do on this earth is meaningless, but we have an eternal focus and, you know, we need to be in that. And our work for the kingdom isn't vain. And uh, verse 4 to 7 in today's chapter showed us the unending cycle of creation. Verse 8 through 11 shows the unending cycle of man's labor. And for born again believers, we have an eternal purpose. I want to go over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. So even as believers, when we go through times where we feel like everything is meaningless, remember that in Christ's eyes, we are important. We are loved by him. And in Revelation 2, 17, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So Revelation 2.17 shows us that we have a new name in God's kingdom. And sometimes people will get a name change on this earth legally. Maybe it was a traumatic childhood and, you know, they got adopted into another family and they take on that family name, whatever the case might be. Or you had a, you know, a, you know, your young years, you were, you know, a repeated criminal and, you know, you changed your life around and everybody knows you by your old last name and you seek a new name. You see, in Christ, we get a new name in God's kingdom. And, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has both made one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And in Christ we belong to a new community. God's kingdom is a new community. 
in Ephesians 4.24. It says that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we have a new nature. We are given a new nature. And we'll see that even in 2 Corinthians 5.17 here. says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So when we are adopted into Christ, we are a new creation and all things become new. You see, life isn't meaningless for believers. In verse 12 through 15, it speaks of searching by wisdom. And we see the chapter ending with a failure of wisdom confirmed. And that's going to wrap up today's video. We'll see you next to be announced as we'll be looking at life in view of death. So I hope you have a great rest of your evening. I hope that you join for the rest of this book. It's an exciting book and it really can hit us. It can really hit us hard, you know, because we might be like, I identify with the author and feeling this way. And I'm hoping as we go through that I can be an encouragement to some of these you know, topics throughout the chapter. So I hope you have a great rest of your night. God bless.